Exactly. Exactly. We, we, we. That's right. That's right. I hide. All right, we ready to get going here? I am. That's that's the goal for the next two nights, and narrow it down. We ready to do that? So, you, all right. As long as so, here's the key thing. As long as you know everything between page one and five hundred in the book, you'll be just fine. <laughs> um, all right, we're gonna start in chapter two. Quite honestly. Chapter one is really just a an overview of everything, and I cannot and I cannot imagine that you would need to see anything directly in chapter one. I mean, obviously you're going to see some of the terminology in chapter one, like real estate. But if you don't know what real estate means at this point in time, <laughs> then next week's not going to go very well. So, so, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just don't waste your time. Um, all right, so in on page 20, 21, we get into chapter 2. Chapter 2 is all about um, ownership interests. And so remember that there are um, several different ways that we can own property. And so that's what this chapter is all about, about the different ways that we can have title to property the different ways we can own property with other people, the different rights that might go along with something like that. Um, the, the first word that you need to make sure you're very familiar with is appurtenance. And at this point, we've used that word a lot in the class. What's, what's somebody's definition of an appurtenance? Something that's attached to the property. Give me examples of appurtenances. Oil and mineral rights, ease, certain types of easements. Zoning would be a pertinent to the property. Um, air rights would be a pertinent to the property. Um, liens are a pertinent to the property. So any of those things, what that means when we say it's a pertinent to the property is that if the property is conveyed, if it's transferred, what happens with all those things? They go with the property. They run with the land. That's exactly right. So make sure you're familiar with that word a pertinent because you're going to see it for sure. Um, over on page 22-23, make sure you take a look at the water rights, the different types of water rights. Remember, there are two main categories, and they're called what? Riparian and littoral. Okay? And riparian rights are those where we have property that borders water, and the water doesn't have a tide. Right? So basically, in North Carolina, we're talking about fresh bodies of water, um, rivers, lakes, streams, creeks, ponds, that sort of thing. Um, generally speaking, what matters the most about any body of water as far as our rights on it? What, what matters the most? It, where the property line is, and that's determined by what? If they're navigable. The most important factor is, is it a navigable body of water? Because if it's a navigable body of water, who owns it? The public does, and therefore the public has the right to access it, right? And if it's owned by the public, where is the property line going to stop and start? At the shoreline. Good. If it's not navigable, who does the water belong to? It belongs to all of the adjoining property owners, right? Their property line is going to go up to the middle. Since the water is private property, can you restrict access to the water? Yes, absolutely, because it's private property. Um, now, with littoral rights, it's always navigable because we're talking about the Atlantic Ocean, the Albemarle Sound, those kinds of bodies of water. Um, that water belongs to the public. Where does the property line begin and end? The high tide line. High tide line. Good. Good. Um, on page 2425, we get into the differentiation between real property and personal property. Real property versus personal property. Now, this is really important to what we do in a transaction because we're writing contracts to convey real property, right? 
and those contracts don't include the personal property. So we need to know what we're selling. That's really the long and short of this chapter. We need to understand what it is that we're selling so that everybody's on the same page. So we talk, we talk about something called a fixture. And fixtures are, generally speaking, things that used to be personal property that have been converted into real property. They've been turned into real property. They used to be personal, now they are real. Okay? And the key here with everything in this section is to know, again, is it going to convey with the transaction or is it not going to convey? Uh, one, of the, one of the ways that somebody explained this to me a while ago was, think of taking the building upside, turn it upside down. Anything that shakes loose and lands on the ceiling is personal property. Anything that stays in place is most likely real property. I guess that's one good way to think of it, right? Um, and th that we know that's not the whole story, but that gets us a long way toward being the whole story. How about plants? Obviously, if plants are in a movable planter, they are personal property. I think that goes without saying. If they're movable, they're not permanently attached. But plants can come in two different varieties. They can be permanently attached real property and permanently attached personal property. Which ones are personal property? Crops. Crops. Good. And everything else that grows on its own is real property. Is everybody good on that? Okay. Yes, ma'am, Michelle. Sure. Uh, so, Michelle's question is, if the plant itself is in a concrete planter that's attached to the property, I would say that's attached to the property. Um, uh, you know, I'd say a movable planter would not be. Uh, I do not expect they would give you that sort of a differentiation on the exam. I looked at a question and it was, which one would be a fixture versus personal property? Mm -hmm. It talked about a refrigerator being in a kitchen that's Mm -hmm. And I had a person who was leasing a home that had put a mailbox and nailed it to the side of the house, and then it had the plans in a planter box and whatnot. With, I, I assumed it was, it had no answer, that was the crazy, mm -hmm. crazy thing. Um, I assumed because it was a lease that it would be personal property and it would be removed, but if they left it, it would be gone. Mm -hmm. So would the refrigerator then be the be real property. So basically, Bobby's question is, you know, he, he, he was trying to differentiate on a question somewhere, and they had a refrigerator, like a built-in type, like a Sub-Zero or something like that refrigerator, um, matched it, the cabinets and all that sort of thing. Um, and he had a, a mailbox that had been attached to the side of the house, but it was attached by a tenant, and then some plants and a flower box. And, um, you know, so, uh, and, the, and the planter is attached. So which of those is most likely to be personal property? Well, the answer is going to be the, the mailbox attached by the tenant. Because remember, that's step two of our test. Step one is the, is it nailed, glued, or screwed test, right? If you turn it upside down, whatever shakes loose is definitely personal property. And anything that sticks might be real property. And the only thing we want to check then is to see the stuff that didn't fall out if it was attached by who? The owner of the property. Because if it was attached by a tenant, what's it going to be? Personal. personal property. It's the personal property of the tenant. They get to remove it prior to their lease expiring. As long as they put the property back in the same condition it was. Okay? Um, so I think if you've got that, you'll be pretty good on what is a fixture and what is not. Um, you know, obviously the intent matters. That's what, we, that's what we're talking about with the tenant. Um, let's see here. Um, we don't need to specifically talk about trade fixtures because trade fixtures are treated just like any other fixture. The definition of a trade fixture is something installed by a tenant. So, of course, it's going to be removable as long as they take it out before the lease expires. Um, okay, now, over on page 28, manufactured homes, modular homes. A manufactured home, is it real property or personal property? 
personal property. Can it be converted to real property? Yes. yes. And, and as long as you put it on a permanent foundation, take out the wheels, axles, and the tongue off the front, and turn the title in. As long as you do those three things, you have converted that manufactured home into real property. <laughs> Modular homes are always what? Real property. They are always real property. And modular homes are actually built to the same building codes that a stick built or site built home would be, whereas manufactured homes are not. Did you say the title needs to be turned in, turned in. to the DMV? Sure. To the DMV. Remember, it's got a car title. Okay. And you got to turn it in because it's no longer mobile. Okay. okay? Turn in the registration, I guess, is a better way to put it. Um, on page 29, we get into the different estates in real estate. And remember, an estate is just what is your legal connection to the property? And specifically here we talk about freehold estates. What does that word freehold mean? It means ownership. Good. It means ownership. It means I own the property. Now, the best form of ownership is something called fee simple absolute. And why is that the best, highest form of ownership that we could possibly have? I can do whatever I want to because my use is not limited and I own it for how long? For, forever because the time is not limited. That's what makes fee simple absolute so great. However, we have to talk about those limitations. All right? So let's talk about the time limitations first. What do we call limitations of time? Life estates. Life estates are limitations of time on our ownership. Okay? Because we only own it until what happens? Until somebody dies. Just that word until, if you associate that word, that's time, right? I, I'm going to class until 10 o'clock. Time always comes after the word until. So I own it until, that's a life estate, that means it's a limitation of time. That's how you, I think it's a good mental association that you can make. Um, there's two different kinds of life estates. Every life estate has somebody called a life tenant. Every life estate has somebody called a measuring life. What's the difference between a conventional life estate and a life estate pour out your V? Well, that's a, that's a difference, not inheritable. I, the other differences I hear are in a conventional, the measuring life and the life tenant are what? Same person. In a life estate pour out your V, they are different people. Is one of them inheritable and one not inheritable? Which one is not inheritable? The conventional life estate. Good. Good. Um, if I name what's going to happen at the end of the life estate, it's going to what kind of an interest? A remainder interest. If I don't name as the grantor what's going to happen, it's going to a reversionary interest. Good. Y'all are on a roll so far. Let's talk about those defeasible fee estates. So now that, that's limitations on time. Let's talk about limitations on use. Defeasible fee. There's two varieties. I can do anything I want except one thing or I can only do one thing. I can only do one thing. That's called fee simple what? Determinable. And the other one's called Fee Simple, the name's too long to remember, right? <laughs> Subject to a condition subsequent. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Good. I like it. Um, all right. We can skip over now to page 34. On page 34 we get into something called concurrent ownership. And concurrent just means more than one owner at the same time, right? What's the opposite of concurrent ownership? Ownership in severalty, because that means just one owner at a time. So concurrent ownership just means more than one owner at a time. And how many different types of concurrent ownership are we given? Three of them. There are three ways that we could have multiple owners with the same properties that we're on page uh, 34. Okay? There's, there's three different ways that we can have different owners have the same property together at the same time. What is the most common one? And there's a hint in there in that name. 
tenants in common. Tenants in common is sort of the default. If I'm not married to this person that I own the property with, we are very likely to be tenants in common. Now, what does that mean about our own? Does it tell us anything about our ownership with each other? Not, not really. It tells us we don't have survivorship because survivorship is not possible with tenants in common, right? Everybody good with that? What is survivorship? So when one owner dies, the other owner or owners, depending on how many there are, would immediately take over or assume or absorb that owner's share immediately without going through the probate process. So the huge advantage of survivorship is that it does not go to probate. And tenancy in common doesn't allow for survivorship. Is there another one on the other end of the spectrum where survivorship is automatic? Tenancy by the entirety is on the far other end of the spectrum. We went from can't have survivorship to we always have survivorship. And what's the big restrictions that are with tenancy by the entirety? Because some rules come along with that thing. I have to be married, right? We have to be married when we purchase the property together to be tenants by the entirety. That's number one. I heard somebody say one to buy and two to sell. What does that mean? I, I get that it's a, it's a cute saying, but what does it actually mean? I can, one spouse can purchase, but it takes both of them to sell. In other words, as Charles was saying, I can't sell my interest in the property without the other person's what? Signature, permission. That right there is a huge difference between any other form of concurrent ownership. Can a tenant in common sell their interest without the other person's consent? Yes, yes a tenant in common absolutely can sell their ownership interest without the consent of the other owner. Can a joint tenant do that? Yes, absolutely. Tenancy by the entirety is the only one where I need the permission of the other owner who owns it with me in order to sell my share. Okay, Charles. I remember you were saying in North Carolina, if you, um, if I bought a property on my own and then I got married, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be automatically tenancy by the entirety, but I still couldn't sell it without. Correct. So Charles' question is, so I, I'm the single one I buy it, so I own it in severalty. Then I get married. So therefore, my spouse has an ownership interest. But it's not automatically tenancy by the entirety. Remember that. There doesn't, tenancy by the entirety is for things that you actually purchased while you were married. You can convert other things to tenancy by the entirety, but it doesn't automatically happen. So what he's saying is, how is it that that's not tenancy by the entirety, but I still can't sell? That gets into marital law. It's, it's outside of real estate law. It's actually marital law. That's also marital law. Uh, it's not called survivorship. It's called a spousal interest. Uh, yeah, it, it, and that gets into a whole different area of law. Like I said, that's a, there's a, that's a big contract you sign when you put that ring on a finger. So, and it's got more to do with, with legal than it does love, let me just tell you. There's a, there's a lot going on there with that. So, all right? So we got the two extremes, tenancy in common, no survivorship, but also what, no rules, right? We don't know anything else about their ownership. Are they equal shares? Don't know. Have no idea. Because in tenancy in common, we could have one owner own 99% and the other owner own 1%. In tenancy by the entire, what, entirety, what's the ownership shares? 50-50, always. Is there one in the middle? that gets us this survivorship thing, but maybe is not so strict as tenancy by the entirety. Joint tenancy. Joint tenancy allows us to have survivorship for unmarried people. That's the best way to think of it. Because married people don't need something to give them survivorship. They've already got it. It's called tenancy by the entirety. But unmarried people wouldn't have this benefit if it weren't for joint tenancy. But there are some rules that come along with joint tenancy. And what are they? You have to buy at the same time, and usually they are equal shares. Absolutely. So everybody has to have purchased. Make sure you're okay. 
Remember we've done the examples in class where I said, you know, we, we said something like we had, you know, three owners. And, you know, they bought the property as joint tenants with the right of survivorship. And we did this. Everybody remember doing those? You know, you got Bob, Sam, and Carl, you know, and they are all joint tenants with the right of survivorship. And why did I draw equal shares? Because they're what? Joint tenants. So we assume equal shares. And we say that, you know, Sam sells his share to Holly. What does that do to this joint tenancy down here? It changes it to tenancy in common. How about up here? Same, tenancy in common. What about this joint tenancy between Bob and Carl? It stays the same because they do have the same duration of ownership. They did buy at the same time. So is the right of survivorship still in place? Yes, but it only benefits who? Bob and Carl. It doesn't benefit Holly over here. Now, be careful with how they give you these answers. Remember, if we said this thing was 30 acres, this piece of property is 30 acres, we are not saying that Holly owns 10 acres and Bob owns 10 acres and Carl owns 10 acres. We are saying that each one of them owns a third of what? Of the full 30 acres. They all have that unlimited use of the property. Does that, does that make sense? They can't put a line on the ground and say, this is your 10 acres and over here is your 10 acres. It doesn't work that way. They all own the entire property together. So make sure when you give your answer, it's not saying that the property has been like subdivided somehow. It, it, that, it does not work that way. Okay? Is everybody good with that? So the way to explain this is, that Bob, Carl, and Holly own the property together, the entire 30-acre property together with Bob and Carl being joint tenants with the right of survivorship and Holly being a tenant in common with Bob and Carl. On the test, would they, because um, in North Carolina, joint tenancy is not automatic survivorship, would they do something like that? No. So Charles' question is, do you have to worry about the fact that joint tenancy is not automatic in North Carolina on the test? And you don't. Because if you get a joint tenancy question, it is going to be in the uh, national section. And in the national section, when you see joint tenancy, you assume survivorship. You assume survivorship. And truthfully, even in North Carolina, we say it's not automatic. But if you go down to the county courthouse and you try to record a deed and it just says as joint tenants and doesn't say with the right of survivorship, Somebody at the clerk's office is going to look at you and go, did you just graduate law school yesterday? What are you asking for? Because what is joint tenancy without the right of survivorship? Tenancy in common. The only reason you would ask for joint tenancy is to accomplish this survivorship thing. So, so it's a good question, but no, you don't have to worry about that. Come on. Tenancy by the entirety of, let's say one of them wills to share something to someone and they die test date. So, that's a good question. The question is, what if we have a husband and wife? Tenancy by the entirety. So, we've got a husband and wife. Annie is married. I don't know if you're married or not. I'm just saying you're not. But Annie is married. And her husband has willed everything without her knowledge to some children that he has with another woman that she also does not know about. <laughs> Uh -huh. That's just rough, isn't it? And something happens to him, and he's killed in a car accident. Annie may or may not have had something to do with the accident, but that's a whole other story, okay? Is that will going to matter? No, and, and here's the reason why. And this is not true of joint tenancy with survivorship, but it's a special feature of tenancy by the entirety. In tenancy by the entirety, you can't disinherit your spouse. You, a will doesn't take the place of tenancy by the entirety. They can say whatever they want to in their will, but the tenancy by the entirety supersedes it. Because in North Carolina, if your spouse passes away, instantly all assets transfer to the other, especially real property. Okay? Does that help with your question? If it was joint tenancy with your wife, would it matter then? It would. 
So his follow-up question was, what if it's joint tenancy with the right of survivorship? Yes. In that case, you can disinherit that other owner. You could actually write a will that would overcome the survivorship. Because they're not married. Because they're not married. Um, and because, remember, you have the ability to sell your interest without the other's permission in joint tenancy. So basically, you could always get rid of it without their permission. So you have the ability to will it away. Now, the person you will it to wouldn't get the benefit of survivorship. It would have to, that would have to go through the probate process, but it could be willed away. So tenancy by the entirety is still stronger than joint tenancy with the right of survivorship. Okay? It's kind of the gold standard when it comes to protecting property rights. Is everybody good on those three? And be able to handle that on the test? Good. Good. Um, that is all you need to know on them. Now, on page 38, we get into something called common interest ownership or community ownership of property. Um, and the first type of community ownership that we deal with is condominiums. Condominiums are a very special type of property ownership. What's the unique thing that makes a condo different from almost everything else that we talk about in this class? This is a real estate class, real property. What's the definition of real property? What's the first word? Land and everything above and below it, right? Land. What are you not buying when you buy a condominium? Land. So it makes it a very unique form of real estate because you're not purchasing land. Now, ultimately, are you buying a share in some land? Yeah, because not only are you buying your unit, so, I'm, so Meredith goes and she buys a condo. She's buying unit 206, and she owns unit 206 in severalty because she's the only owner. Is everybody with me so far? However, she's also, let's say there are 100 units in that complex. She's also buying into the property owners association or homeowners association, and she would be buying, if there's 100 units, what percent of the homeowners association would she be buying? 1% which means she would own 1% of everything that the HOA owned. And in this case, in the case of a condo, what does the HOA own? The land, the buildings, the community, common areas, all that stuff. Parking lot, roof, structure, the whole nine yards is all owned by the homeowners association. So Meredith might not be purchasing the specific land that her unit is built on, but she is buying a share in land. Does everybody follow with that? And what is she going to be with all those other unit owners? A tenant in common. And why does it have to be tenancy in common? Because people are going and coming all the time, different times. Nobody owns for the same amount of time. Okay? Is everybody good on condominiums? Now, there's a law we need to talk about. The North Carolina Condominium Act of 1986. There's not a ton you need to know about that. But you do need to know which condos it applies to. New construction, absolutely. New construction condos are the target of the Condominium Act in North Carolina. And basically, any condo that's subject to the Act, what does that do for the buyer of that condominium? It gives them seven days after they go under contract. Not after they make an offer. After they go under contract to do what? Back out, change their mind, get all their money back. It's a seven-day right of rescission. But remember, it's only on new construction condos. It only applies to new construction condos. Good. Over on page 39, co-ops. Remember I told you there were basically one, one thing to look for that would stand out if they were asking you to identify a co-op, and that is that you were buying what? Stock. You're buying shares of stock. That's what you're looking for with a co-op. That's You don't need to understand any more than that. I'm happy to answer questions if you have them, but truly, all you would need to know is to identify. I don't even think you would ever see a question about co-ops, but you might see it as an answer choice, and I don't want you to go, well, I don't remember what that is. Just remember, it deals with shares of stock. So if the question didn't say anything about shares of stock, co-op is not the answer. Because you can't describe a co-op 
without talking about stock in a corporation of some type. Okay? Good. Um, townhouses, nothing special there. Over on page 40, timeshare ownership. Something special here. What is a timeshare in North Carolina? You need to know that definition. So it's the right to occupy a property for five or more what? Time periods. So usually timeshares are sold in what? Weeks. So just say five or more weeks. It doesn't have to be weeks, but that's usually what you buy. When you buy a timeshare, you're buying a week, usually one week per year. North Carolina defines a timeshare as five or more of those time periods spread out over the course of how long of a period of time? Five or more years. And if you purchase a timeshare in North Carolina, any timeshare in North Carolina, after you sign the contract, after you go under contract, can you still change your mind? Yes. For how long? Five days. Five days. And there's one other thing that's really special about timeshares in North Carolina, as far as the North Carolina Real Estate Commission is concerned. It's the one time the commission can find somebody. One time that the Real Estate Commission can actually find somebody, and that maximum fine is... $500 per violation with no max for total, you know, amount, but $500 per violation. And that's for the developer. It's not for the licensee who might be selling the timeshares. It's for the developer. Right, the licensee, their license could be suspended or revoked. It could be reprimanded, all the normal things that could happen to a licensee. The timeshare developer could lose their timeshare license and all that sort of thing, but they certainly could also be fine. That's the big one for them. Okay? We all good with that? Good. Um, we already talked about uh, probate. I think that is going to be it for Chapter 2. All right. Don't you wish we could go through them that fast when we were started the class? Some, somehow I don't think you'd be able to understand it if I did it that short. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, chapter three. Encumbrances. An encumbrance is just a, a limitation. Encumbrance is just a limitation on what you can do. You can't start all that yawning, because if you do, I will. <laughs> it's contagious. Okay? Encumbrance is on real property. The first type of limitation or encumbrance that we talk about in Chapter 3 is a lien. A lien. So give me a good definition of a lien. Obviously, I know I owe money, but it's more than that. What? Right to foreclose. A lien is a right to foreclose on the property. It attaches to the piece of property. We call liens like that specific liens. Specific liens. So, give me some examples of specific liens. Property taxes would be a specific lien. What else? Mechanics liens would be an example of a specific lien. Mortgages would be an example of a specific lien. There's another one. There's one more hanging Special assessments, exactly, Nancy, exactly. Special assessments. Those are the big categories of specific liens that we generally talk about. And they are a pertinent to the property. What does that mean? They run with the property. They run with the land. So if Meredith has a special assessment lien on her property and she sells it to me, Who's now going to be responsible for that special assessment lien? I am. Now, I may not be person. So we hear this sometimes when we talk about that with mortgages. Because we say mortgages are pertinent. They run with the property. So let's change my example. Meredith has a mortgage lien on that property. And she sells it to me. And she doesn't satisfy that mortgage lien. Now, it's not going to affect my credit if she doesn't pay that mortgage lien. I'm not going to personally assume responsibility. So why do I say the lien 
is going to be my responsibility because the lien is attached to what? The property. And who now owns the property? I do. So the danger to me is, yeah, it can't hurt my credit, but can they foreclose on my property? Right. Because that lien, remember, is a right to foreclose. Everybody okay with that? Good. Good. So let's talk about the property tax liens. Property tax liens. First of all, let's talk about the calendar. When do property tax liens become a lien? January 1st of the current year, right? Mm -hmm. So, for example, my January 17, or my 2017 property taxes have been a lien since January 1 of this year, 2017. When would they be delinquent? January 6th of the following year is when they would be actually delinquent. Good. That's good. Um, your book also talks about mechanics liens, which are on page 52. A mechanics lien. What is it? Somebody's done work on my property of some type, and they did not get paid. And because they were working on real property, they have a right to do what? Put a lien on the property, which could ultimately lead to them having the right to foreclose on the property. That's what a mechanics lien is. Are there some rules associated with mechanics liens? Yeah, exactly. They're filing rules. What, are, what is that rule? How long do I have to file that mechanics lien? 120 days after they finished. After they last did work, after they finished working on the property. Do they have a certain amount of time to foreclose on that property? 180 days from when they finished work. Good, good. Now, let's talk about the priority of liens real quickly. We named off, we, we named off some specific liens. We said property taxes were a specific lien and special assessments and mortgages were a specific lien and mechanics liens were specific liens. What does it mean when we say different liens have different priority? They're first in line to get paid. Exactly. When we say that liens have priority, we're just saying that they're first in line to get paid. So what liens are first in line to get paid? Property taxes. Property taxes and their cousin, what? Special assessments sit up there at the top of that lien priority. And here's what that means. It doesn't matter when the tax lien is filed. It's going to always be ahead of every other lien. It's going to get paid first. So even if, it's, even, if, even if it's the mechanic who forecloses, the HVAC company forecloses, they don't get paid first when the property is sold at foreclosure. Who would get paid first? The property taxes, any outstanding special assessments, and then what comes next? The mortgages, and if there are more than one mortgage in the order they're what? In the order they're recorded, exactly. And then we finally get down to the mechanics liens. They sit all the way at the very bottom of that list. Okay, good. Um, we don't need to talk about general liens. A general lien is just a lien against a person rather than a piece of property. Okay, um, now if you turn over to page 55, we get into easements. What is an easement? The right to do what with somebody else's land? Use it. Not, not take ownership of it, but just use it. The right to use someone else's property. The right to access it. So basically, I'm entering somebody else's property and they don't have the right to tell me to do what? To get out. It's their property, but they don't have the right to tell me to get out. That's what an easement is, because I have the legal right to be there if I have an easement. Now, easements come in a couple different varieties. And what primarily dictates which is which? Serving and dominant. Serving and dominant has a lot to do with it, but... So, 
a pertinent is a type of easement, but what the way they go about it is different. That's not the primary difference, though. Isn't one of them last forever and the other one ends at some point in time? That's the big difference. So which one ends at some point in time? Easement, easement in gross. An easement in gross ends at some point in time. Because easements in gross end with the death of the easement holder. Remember, I, I, I told y'all that there was a, a difference between hell of a long time and forever, right? <laughs> easements in gross do last a hell of a long time. Especially in the case of the most common easement in gross, which is what? A utility easement. Utility easement is by far the most common easement in gross. And clearly they're going to last a very long time because utility companies themselves last a very long time. But eventually, the idea is that the company will go out of business and when it does, those easements and gross will disappear because the beneficiary of the easement has gone away. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. Now, another thing about an easement and gross that's different is that there is no dominant tenement. Now remember we talk about, we're going to talk about an appurtenant easement in just a second and we say in an appurtenant easement there's a servient tenement and there's a dominant tenement because with an appurtenant easement there's always how many pieces of property? Two. Two pieces of property. With easements in gross we're always talking about an individual piece of property. It's the piece of property where the easement's located. Is everybody with me on that? And so what do we always call that piece of property? Where's the easement located? That's a servient property. With easements and gross, we only have servient properties. There is no dominant property with an easement and gross. Does that make sense to everybody? Are you good with that? So let's talk about the other one, an appurtenant easement. Well, that word appurtenant means something. It means what? Attached to the land and forever. Forever. Appurtenant means forever. To have an appurtenant easement, we need two pieces of property. They need to be side by side. They have to share a boundary. And one of these properties is going to be called the servient tenement. The other one's going to be called the dominant tenement. Where is the easement itself located? The on the servient tenement. The easement's on the servient tenement. Everybody good with that? Now, remember with any type of easements, they don't automatically go away unless there's only one case I can think of where an easement would automatically go away. If I have an appurtenant easement and I do what? If I buy the other property. If I end up owning both properties of an appurtenant easement, because an easement is the right to use somebody else's property, the easement is going to go away. But would, for example, an easement in gross go away just because Norfolk Southern Railroad stopped using the easement? No. no, it would not. You may be able to get rid of it for that reason, but it doesn't automatically terminate. So be, be careful of that kind of language. Easements don't just automatically go away. Is everybody good with that? If you purchase, so, so at one point you own the one piece of land, and then you bought the other one as an easement, say you sell that again, does that recreate or does it... You would have to recreate it because it's gone. It's because it's gone. And so when you sell whichever property you decide to sell, you're going to decide if you want to recreate an easement. And it, and it wouldn't have to be in the same place because you're recreating. Yeah, yeah, so you could, you could put... So you could essentially, if I bought both properties and the easement went away, when I decided to sell one, could I put the easement on the other property and make what used to be the dominant into the servient and vice versa? Because I have to recreate it at that point in time. Is everybody good with that? Okay, good. All right, that's, I think, about all you would need to see about easements. However, um, I always point out to you two different types of easements on page 57. An easement by necessity and an easement by prescription. An easement by necessity and an easement by prescription. What's an easement by necessity? You're landlocked. You'd be landlocked without the easement anyway, right? 
So you're creating a piece of property, you're subdividing a piece of property that without the easement it would be landlocked. You have to have access to a public roadway. That's an easement by necessity. What's an easement by prescription? It's very similar to adverse possession. After 20 years of what? Use. Of use. What kind of use? Open use. Illegal use, right? Ill the key word here is illegal use because you're trespassing for 20 years. And you're doing it openly, continuously, exclusively. Ocean, right? And in the open, notoriously, without permission. So you're doing it out in the open, you're doing it continuously for at least 20 years, you're doing it exclusively, and you're doing it without permission. That's, those are the requirements for an easement by prescription, which are also the requirements for what? Adverse possession. Whereas with adverse possession, I'm not claiming the right to use your property, I'm actually claiming what? Ownership of the property. I'm actually claiming ownership of the property with adverse possession. So adverse possession is even more extreme than an easement by prescription. As long as it's first proof and like maintaining, right? It, there's a lot that goes into it. It's really up to the discretion of a judge, honestly. Yeah, it's a tough thing to give you a it's it, it's it case by case basis. Very much a case by case basis. Okay? Um, encroachment on page 57. What is an encroachment? Something as an improvement extends across what? A property line. Good. An improvement that extends across a property line. On page 58, we get into the specifics of property taxes in North Carolina. In North Carolina, we use something called an ad valorem property tax, which means we tax things based on their full market value. That's how we do it in North Carolina. How often do we set the full market value of that property? Every eight years. We call that the octennial reappraisal. That's done once every eight years. And can that number change at all during that eight-year period? At the four-year mark, we could do what? A horizontal adjustment, which is an up or down set across the board amount. That's different than an octennial reappraisal. When we do the octennial reappraisal, what are we doing with each individual property? A separate evaluation. Whereas with a horizontal adjustment, it would be like saying everybody in this room just got two inches taller. Because it's just a, an across the board, everything gets treated the same with a horizontal adjustment. Okay. Whereas the octennial reappraisal would be we individually measured every person in the room to see what they had done. Okay. We talked about the taxation timetable, so I think you're good with that. Make sure you are familiar with the math of property taxes. Obviously, we did several of those last <coughs> night. Make sure you can calculate a tax bill using a North Carolina tax rate. Make sure you can do a property tax proration between a buyer and a seller based on the date of closing. So if they tell you that the property taxes have not yet been paid and they're going to be paid later in the year by the buyer, what's the proration going to look like? Debit seller. Debit seller, credit buyer. Because if the buyer paid outside of closing, who's got to pay at closing? The seller. You always do the opposite, right? And if it's the seller who's paying, what part of the year is it going to be? The first part of the year from January 1 through date of closing, whatever that date is. Okay, Good. And if the taxes have already been paid by the seller outside of closing, who's going to pay at closing? Buyer. buyer. That's a buyer debit, seller credit, and it's going to be for day after closing through end of the year. Is everybody good with that? Okay. So I would not be surprised if you saw that in a couple of different questions. You could, obviously, that's going to be part of the closing statement question where you have to figure up the buyer's cash due at closing. I would also expect there would be one just standalone property tax proration question. So that's, you know, and it's an important thing to make sure you can properly do a proration for property taxes. All right. Um, 
special assessments on page 61, we said these get high priority. They sit up there with property tax liens at the very top. What is a special assessment? Sidewalks, lighting, some kind of public improvement, but made where? On my property. That's the key to a special assessment. This is not a park, right? This is something they're doing on my property for the public good. But guess who gets to pay for it? I do. You're welcome, public. And I have to pay for it because it's an improvement on my property. It theoretically raises the value of my property. So examples of that would be sidewalks, street lights, uh, water and sewer. And you don't even necessarily have to tap on to the water and sewer, but just giving you access to it, running them across your property is, you know, so think of that, water and sewer. Here they're going to come and condemn, condemn an easement. They're going to take an easement from you, dig up your front yard and bury the water and sewer pipes, and then send you a bill for the trouble. And you still aren't connected to them. <laughs> so, uh, and there'll be another fee for that if you'd like to do it. But that's a special assessment. What if they make a double lane? So if they widen the road? Widen, yeah. No, if they widen the road, that's not going to be your property any longer because they're going to take the property. And what, what do we call that when they take the property? That's called eminent domain. Eminent domain, right. To take the property for the public good. Good. Is everybody good on a special assessment? Um, I don't think you'll see the Machinery Act. That's the law that governs the you know, property taxation in North Carolina. I don't think you'll see it specifically, but it is the law that governs property taxes. What you will see is likely a mill rate. And for your references, all you need to know about a mill rate is how to do what? Turn it into an NC rate. And to, to go from mill rate to North Carolina rate, you're going to divide by 10. To go from North Carolina rate to mill rate, you're going to multiply by 10. So make sure you're comfortable with doing that. Make sure you can convert a North Carolina rate into a mill rate. <coughs> and that is it for chapter 3, other than the math, which we went over last night, obviously. <coughs> Yes, in my opinion, that math packet is a pretty good indication of most anything you could see. Um, you know, I realized this morning there's not a gross rent multiplier in there, um, so I probably tomorrow night will give you at least one gross rent multiplier just in case you see that on the test. Um, but even still, that packet's a pretty dang good indicator of what you could expect. You know, of those 32 questions, I think about everything's covered of the type you can expect. I'm sorry? Gross rent multiplier, was it on the midterm? I can't remember. It was on a worksheet we did. It's on a worksheet we did, for sure. And, and remember, it's just, the, it's just the purchase price divided by monthly rent. That's all. I mean, it's a really, you've got the formula for it in your formula packet. That's the quick way to Of a residential property that's used as an income producing property. So it's like a quick version of the income capitalization approach. You just take the monthly rent and divide it into the sales price because what it tells you is how many months it takes you to get your money back, essentially. That's what a gross rent multiplier is. Okay. Um, chapter four is the legal description chapter. What type of legal description do we use in North Carolina? Meets and bounds. Now, the problem with a meets and bounds description is it's very long. It's very long because it's a perimeter-based description, right? You start at a place of beginning, and then they give you those references and tell you to move all the way around, and that gets very long-winded with a lot of stuff that you could screw up. Where do you end up once you've finished? The same place you started. Point of beginning is also the point of ending. Okay, good. Now, 
because meets and bounds can be fairly confusing, especially on something like a sales contract, what is the more common method that we use on sales contracts? The lot and block system, the plat map system. Okay, that's the most common, particularly in areas that have been subdivided. And why would that be common in areas that have been subdivided? What is a plat map? It's a map of a subdivision. So since you're recording the map of that subdivision, we have a plat map to refer to. And that's why we use that. Now, we also need to talk about the government rectangular survey. The good old government rectangular survey. How many acres are there in one section under the government rectangular survey? 640. And why is that number important? Because it helps you figure out the what? Math question. The math question, right? <laughs> it, it helps you figure out the size of the lot. Right? Because they'll give you that big long string, the northern half of the southwestern quarter of the southern half of blah, 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 blah. And it's always of section so-and-so, township, we don't care, right? Because section so-and-so is always how many acres? 640 acres, because every section is 640 acres. So to do the math, you're just going to divide 640 by all the denominators, the bottom numbers, and that'll give you the number of acres for that piece of land. So that's going to be the next thing. That the only other potential thing they could even think of asking you about the government rectangular survey, in my opinion, is how many sections are in a township. And there are 36 sections in a township. Each section, in addition to being 640 acres, also happens to be one what? Square mile. And there are how many in a township? How many sections? 36 sections in a township. By the way, did y'all know an acre is roughly the size of a football field? Mm -hmm. That's where the sizing of a football field comes from. Yep. And it was also the amount of land that one man could plow with an ox in a day. That's, uh, that, was where, that is where the size came from. So all, of our, you know, all of our measurements are funky in this country, but that's where an acre comes from. That's a big piece of land. I'm not doing that with an ox. I don't even want to walk it, much less walk behind an ox and do it. Uh, they work too hard. I'm glad I live now. <laughs> All right, is everybody good on this stuff? All right. Um, I think that's it for the government rectangular survey. That's certainly it for meets and bounds. Um, the reference to the recorded plat or lot and block system, I think everybody's good on that. Um, one last thing I want to talk about here is street disclosures. And I can't even remember it's in chapter 4, but it just hit my mind, so I'm going to talk about it here. Street disclosures. Are streets public or private? That's a big-time disclosure, right? Yeah. And the answer is, it depends. You've got to look it up. You've got to check. What is the process for a street becoming a public roadway in North Carolina? It's a two-step process. What has to happen? The developer does one part and the state does the other. So what's the, what's the, what's the first part? Apply. Well, apply and so get, keep going. What is, what is the developer going to say to the state? Our neighborhood's yes, please take this street from us. That is called dedication. So put that in your notes if you don't know that word. That's called dedication. The process that the developer goes through where they say to the state, we would love to give you this gift of this street. That is called dedication. And the last step is the state's job. The state's job is called acceptance. It doesn't become a public roadway until the acceptance piece has happened. All right? So that's all you need to know about street disclosures. What part does the developer do? Dedication. What part does the state do? Acceptance. When does it become a publicly maintained roadway? When both have happened, after acceptance. So it could be dedicated as a public street, but is it going to be a public street yet? No, not until it's been accepted.
not until it's been accepted. All right. So make sure you just you, that's all you need to be familiar with about street disclosures is those two uh, pieces of vocabulary: dedication and acceptance. I don't know the answer to that. That's why I said I, I don't think it's in Chapter 4. I couldn't remember off the top of my head. So, I, I, But it came to me that I needed to talk about it, so I went ahead and did it. All right, let's look at Chapter 5. This is called a real estate class and fast forward. You like it? Well, now that you know it, right? It helps a lot if you know it in advance. Okay? Well, you know, I told you it used to be just 25 questions true false, right? Is that the test you want? We'll give you, you know, you have the option of taking the old test if you want. I never can tell you that, but you can take the original one. Exactly. Exactly. Just go out to the state fairgrounds and wait for somebody to show up to give it to you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. that's, where they, that's where they did it, apparently. You just went and showed up and paid some money and sat down at the fairgrounds. I don't know if you sat in the stalls or what, but that's where you got your video. Did you hear what she said? She said a 30-minute video. Bless her heart, right? You know, when that was happening, there was no video. You know, there might have been two people acting something out, but there was not a video going on. You know? <laughs> so. All right, or like a, one of those reel-to-reel, -reel, you know, yeah, yeah, projectors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what, what, are, what are those things called? Um, I can't even remember. What are, the, what are the, the clicker things that you look through called? Is it called a viewfinder? There was some other name for that thing, wasn't it? Yeah, like, I forget what that thing I had something, something. Yeah, you put the little round card and you clicked and it and it went around and around and around. You know, it didn't take much to entertain us back then. You know, we're pretty we're pretty dumb if you think about it. You know, like we play with the box as much as we did with the thing, right? So, um, page eighty four, page eighty four, chapter five, and then we'll take a break. All right. So, transferring title. Transferring title. This chapter is all about what four-letter word? Be careful with your answer. <laughs> Deeds. The Viewmaster. View Viewmaster. There you go. The Viewmaster. Uh, I loved mine. They were all red, too. Everybody's was red. I had a little case in mine. The Viewmaster. Um, so, methods of transferring title. Deeds. A deed is the tool that we use to transfer ownership of real property from a grantor to a grantee. The grantor transfers ownership to the grantee. And most of the time when a deed's involved, we call that a voluntary alienation. Most of the time when a deed's involved, we call that a voluntary alienation because the grantor is signing the deed. They're signing their ownership over. Now, um, there are three major types of deeds, and they're on page 86 in your textbook. The general warranty deed, the special warranty deed, or limited warranty means the same thing, and the quit claim or non-warranty deed. So, talk to me about a general warranty deed. What, it, what's forever? Guaranteed. The guarantee from who? From the grantor. The guarantee from the grantor that the grantee is going to have what? Clear, marketable title. and the, With no clouds, exactly. And that guarantee is good for how long? Forever. forever all the way back into time and all the way forward into the future. Warranty forever. That's the key thing to a general, that's how you recognize a general warranty deed. It lasts forever. The guarantees are never ending. So obviously that's the best type of deed from the grantee's perspective. And it's the worst type from the grantor's perspective because the grantor is making that guarantee. That puts them on the hook for that thing. 
What is a limited warranty or special warranty deed? So there's some guarantee here. The grantor is still guaranteeing, but now instead of guaranteeing forever, what are they guaranteeing? Just the time that they own the property. They're only guaranteeing the title for the period of time that the grantor owned the property. They're basically saying, I don't really know anything about what happened before I own this property, so therefore I'm not making any guarantees about what happened before I own this property. <coughs> Is everybody good with that? That's most commonly used, by the way, in a foreclosure sale. When you, when you have obtained the property through a foreclosure sale and then you go to resell it later, you would probably use a special warranty deed because you wouldn't want to guarantee that the person before you, who was the one that was foreclosed on, hadn't created some issue with the title. And then we come to a quit claim deed or the non-warranty deed. What, what does a quit claim deed guarantee? Nothing. Not even that you own it. It doesn't even try to pretend that I own it, right? It just says, I have no idea. Your guess is as good as mine. But, and it's a big but, if I do own it, by chance, what am I doing? I'm transferring it over to you. I am quitting my claim in the property. I'm not saying I ever had a claim to begin with. I'm just saying that if I did happen to have one, it's now gone. That's a quit claim deed. Is everybody okay on that? What do we most commonly... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Zach. That was going to be my next question. That's a, a perfect lead-in. So what do we primarily use a quit claim deed for? More common. What does Zach say? Fix a defect. Well, it could be major. It could be major. Maybe, maybe there were a husband and wife and only one of them signed a deed 15 years ago. That's a pretty major defect, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. We would still fix that with a quit claim deed. Because think of it in this way. If the question is whether she signed or not, or whether she should have signed or not, what's the best way to fix that? get her to sign. sign. And that's exactly what she's doing in a quit claim deed. She's saying, whatever right I might have had, don't know if I had one or not, I'm forfeiting it. I'm quitting it. And I'm giving whatever those rights might have been over to you. So in the case of, if I have a defect in my title, or if Zach has a defect in his title, and he's trying to, he's trying to sell the property to me, and my title search reveals his defect in the title, he would want to have whoever might have a claim on his property sign a quit claim deed. And who would they be granting ownership to? Him. Right to him. Because if the question is, well, I don't know if I really own it because this person may own a piece of it. Well, a quit claim erases that question. Does that make sense? Because in a quit claim, what they're saying is, whatever ownership I might have had, it's yours. So it gets rid of the past. It gets rid of the past. It's like in a big eraser. That's exactly right. It erases those clouds, those defects. So that's going to be really important in an exam setting. If you're ever asked what the primary function of a quit claim deed is, it's to cure defects or clear clouds on the title to fix those questions of ownership. Now, Bobby, you asked about a correction deed. A correction deed is strictly for like typographical errors, misspell a name. You know, you got one letter wrong in the property description. Lot numbers wrong, something like that. Whereas uh, an ownership question would be a quit claim deed. Because okay. that's what a defect is. A defect is a defect is not a typographical error. A defect is we don't know who owns it. The person who says they own it may not own it. That's a defect. It's a pretty serious one. And the way to fix that is a quit claim deed. Is everybody good with that? Okay. Now. Remember, nobody tells the grantor what kind of deed they have to use. Even if I got the property through foreclosure, can I give a general warranty deed to whoever I'm selling the property to? Absolutely, because it's my choice what guarantees I want to make. 
So don't let a test talk you into somebody has to do this type of deed. They bought the property this way, so they have to give this type of deed. They got a quick claim deed, so now they have to give a quick claim deed. They got a quick claim, so now they have to give a special warranty. Baloney. You do whatever you want because you're the one making the guarantee. Could I have gotten it via general warranty deed and decide I'm only going to transfer it with a quick claim deed? Sure. Sure I can because I don't have to guarantee it. I choose to. And most of the time, I choose to because the buyer demands it. Most of the time, the buyer is saying, I'm not taking title any other way. But there's no rules about that. Is everybody okay on that? So the current owner can change the type of deed at any, like, when they're handing it over. When they're transferring title. Because that's the purpose of a deed, right? Is to transfer a title. There's no changing a deed. A deed only exists in that instant that you use it, right? Because a deed is for that transfer. That's what it does. A deed just transfers it from boom, boom. That's it. Deed's dead. Done. It served its purpose. Because ownership's been transferred. Yeah, go ahead, Nicholas. They're giving you a special warranty deed? Generally speaking, so his question is, how, when do I know what kind of deed I'm getting? Generally speaking, most purchase contracts specify the type of deed that's going to be given. Like, for example, you know, we go over that standard offer to purchase and contract in this class from the Association of Realtors. It specifies a general warranty deed. So the seller is agreeing when they sign that contract that they will convey the property using a general warranty deed. Most purchase contracts drafted by an attorney would specify the type of deed that was going to be used. And so therefore, if you were buying a foreclosure property, that's why the banks use their own contracts that their attorneys drafted, because it's going to specify that they would give you a special warranty deed. Usually you know well in advance, like when you go under contract. Okay? Is everybody good on the three main categories of deeds there? Okay, good. Just like what? No, no, you do not need to. The question was, do we need to know the special purpose deeds? No, do not. As long as you know those three main categories, then you will be good. Okay, page 96. Oh, yeah, sorry. It's not, and interestingly, it really doesn't matter because, so his question was, as a broker, do I have to look and see what kind of deed my seller got if I'm listing the property? Here's the interesting thing about this. It doesn't matter what kind of deed they got because, in theory, they're going to be using the standard offer to purchase and contract when an offer comes in, and it's going to specify that they have to give whoever they're selling the property to a what kind of deed? A general warranty deed, no matter what kind of deed they got. And, 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 that, and so that really gets to the heart of the matter. In today's world, these guarantees are relatively meaningless. These guarantees were created when the only guarantee you had about good title was whatever you got from the grantor. In today's day and age, we use title insurance for that. Our guarantee of good title is that we have a title insurance policy. So all I need to know about my sellers is that they have title insurance. Because even if they did have a defect in their title, we have something that's going to cover it and take care of that defect. I was thinking you can't give something that you don't have, but that's how you... But you can in this case because all you're giving is your own guarantee. That, that, that's the key with these deeds. You're giving your own guarantee, so you can choose to guarantee it or not. So I like to think of it like a car. You know, If I'm selling used cars, most of the time I'm going to sell it like buy here, pay here, no warranty, as is. Could I choose to sell it with a bumper-to-bumper -bumper full warranty if I wanted to? Yeah. Absolutely. I'd be taking a huge risk by doing so, but I could choose to do that. And deeds work exactly the same way. It's up to the seller, the grantor, to decide what kind of warranty they want to give when they sell the thing. Okay? Um, over on page 96, uh, a sheet, an eminent domain. These are the two ways that your property becomes state property. 
public property. What is in a sheet? You die without a will. Not without your intestines. You die intestate. <laughs> I think that's a different thing. When you, I think it's called disembowelment, technically. Right? But that's like a Game of Thrones reference all of a sudden. But if you die intestate, it means you die without a will. You die without a will. If you die without a will, the state creates a will for you. It's called the law of intestate succession. You don't need to know that for the test. But the long and short of that is if they can't find your heirs or if you don't have any, then they take it. And they is the state of North Carolina. That's what an sheet is. It's when you die without a will and they can't find any heirs for you after what I'm sure is an exhaustive search. <laughs> yeah, they, right. They put it in the local newspaper, which exactly nobody reads any longer. <laughs> and, uh, and the truth of the matter is most of your local newspapers in North Carolina only survive on the laws that require these things to be filed in the local newspaper because almost all of these laws say the way you give public notice is in the local print newspaper. So all of these foreclosure notices legally have to be printed and of course there's a fee associated with that so that's how most of your local papers stay in business. And, um, but a sheet is when you die without a will and the state cannot locate any heirs for you. They take ownership of your property. Eminent domain is a much more active taking of your property. Eminent domain is when the state, county, city has decided that your private property would be better used as public property. And so they're going to take your property for the public good. Okay? The power is called eminent domain. That's the law, the power that allows to do it. The actual act of taking is called what? Condemnation. Condemnation. That's exactly right. They condemn the property. If they were doing, um, for example, if they were condemning an easement, that would be if they were taking an easement on the property, whereas condemning the property would be actually taking what? Ownership of the property. Taking ownership of the property. So just make sure you're familiar with eminent domain. And I don't think you need to know any more of the details of eminent domain in North Carolina. Okay. Um, uh, on page 97, they do talk about adverse possession. Now, adverse possession is taking your property, but it's not taking it by the state or some government entity. Adverse possession is your property being taken by some private entity, some other person, usually a neighbor. I mean, most, the most common cases of adverse possession involve neighbors because that's obviously when it's the easiest to just sort of lay claim to somebody's property when it's right beside your own. So, in order to make a claim of adverse possession, you have to prove that without permission you have already taken the property illegally and you did it at least how long ago? 20 years ago, and you took it continuously over those 20 years. You took it exclusively, which means you were the only one using it over those 20 years, and you did it without the owner's permission. That's that ocean thing. So that's how you recognize adverse possession on the test. Are we okay with that? Okay. Um, I think you can ignore the transfer of title via will. I don't think you need to know a devise okay, or a devisee. Um, on page 99, we get into title and public records, um, and we talk about recordation of documents. This is the first time we come into contact with something called the Connor Act. The Connor Act is a law in North Carolina that says certain legal documents must be what to in, be enforced in a court of law? Recorded. recorded. Certain legal documents must be recorded in order to be enforceable in a court of law. And since we're in the title transfer chapter, what, why do you think we're all of a sudden talking about the Connor Act? What legal document that is prominently featured in this chapter needs to be recorded in order to be enforceable in a court of law? A deed. A deed. A deed needs to be recorded 
in order to be enforceable in a court of law. So, what we're basically saying is anybody making a claim against the property, those claims don't become enforceable unless the deed is what? Recorded. The deed has to be recorded in order to be enforceable. Now, that sounds confusing because early in the chapter they said the deed didn't have to be recorded in order to be valid. It only had to be written in order to be valid. Valid is not enforceable in a court of law when it comes to deeds. So what that means is when Zach sells his property to me with that general warranty deed, the moment he hands me the general warranty deed, I have a valid deed. Meaning ownership belongs to who? Me. But in the eyes of the state of North Carolina, ownership doesn't belong to me. Even though legally the property is mine, who does the state recognize? The owner of record. That's the magic phrase, the owner of record. So how do I become the owner of record? I record my deed and then it becomes an enforceable document, meaning nobody can challenge my ownership in court because it's mine. Does that make sense for everybody? And that's according to what law? The, the, the Connor Act. Certain documents only have to be in writing and then what law is that? Statute of Frauds. Statute of Frauds. Frogs like frog legs, she said. Okay. Um, yes. Over on page 101, it talks about basically the process of a title search and then title assurance and or, and or title insurance. So make sure you're familiar with a couple of different things here. Number one, we need to talk about what a chain of title is and what an abstract of title is. What's the chain of title? That's exactly right. If, if that property has been transferred 20 times, we want to lay out all 20 deeds in a row so that I can walk from one end to the other and I can see an unbroken transfer there's never a gap. Does that make sense for everybody? That's a chain of title. The abstract of title is like, okay, let me just jot down here. Okay, this one went to this one, and this one went to this one on one sheet. That's the abstract. It's the short version, the cheating version. Chain of title is the whole shebang. Does that make sense for everybody? Who does that research? Closing attorney. Closing attorney. That's their job. That's their job. Now, in North Carolina, we have something called a mar the Marketable Title Act. What does the Marketable Title Act do in North Carolina? Well, you, well, you say anything after 30 years. I'm after 30 years, and I still count. So, Any ownership claim more than 30 years old doesn't matter it's extinguished by law so basically if you think you have a claim you better make that claim within how many years 30 years so that means for all practical purposes we only do title searches back how far 30 years good now if you were asked this kind of a question about closings in North Carolina you know when when is closing first of all when the deed has been what Recorded. Does it matter when it's signed? Does it matter when we sit down at the attorney's office? No. It's closed when it's recorded. So when is everybody going to get paid? After it's recorded. Like the seller, for example. When are they going to get their money? After it's recorded. Good. That's when they should get keys, yes. Is when it's recorded. Okay. Um, as far as title insurance, you don't need to study an Alta title policy. Just know that title insurance is insurance that you purchase that would guarantee you don't have any defects in your title. It is generally more expensive if you have something like a special warranty deed or a quick claim deed. Kind of 
They will insure it, absolutely. And mo I mean, generally speaking, the only time they won't insure it is if they actually found a defect in the title. If they actually find a defect, they're going to want to see the defect cured or corrected before they'll issue the title insurance. But they will issue title insurance if they don't find a defect. Here are your options. Absolutely. That, those are title insurance folks. Those are the attorneys that work for the title insurance company. And essentially what they do is they find whoever might legally have that claim and they go visit them and they do whatever they can to get them to sign a quit claim deed. Broken kneecaps included. I'm kidding. A little bit. Okay. Does that make sense for everybody? What title insurance does? When would you buy title insurance? When you what? When are you getting title? When you purchase the property. So when would you need to get new title insurance? The next time you buy a property. So you never need it again because you're only insuring your title one time. You buy the property, you get title insurance. That title insurance is good forever because you own the property continuously. There's nothing else to insure. Yes, title insurance would be a debit to the buyer. That's exactly right. And a lot of times you'll see, you know, on, on closing statements, it'll say lender's title insurance and borrower's title insurance. Well, guess who's paying for all of it? The borrower is. That's exactly right. Because the lender is forcing them to buy title insurance that covers the lender as well. Okay? Everybody good with that? Um, that, let's see, we talked about the Connor Act. That's it. Oh, excise taxes on page 106. Please make sure you don't miss an excise tax math question. Remember, purchase price divided by 500, but what? No change. Round up to the nearest whole dollar. Always up. Always up. Nothing on Alta. All right, let's take a break. I mean, gosh, we've done, we've we've done five chapters. It's time for a break, right? Yep. Uh, I might get it uploaded tomorrow, maybe. Maybe. It's possible. Maybe.